Hi, everybody, and welcome to the program. Uh, my name is Dave Kyle. I'm with PA Flyfish. For those of you who are not familiar with uh, my website, um, PA Flyfish was started 25 years ago by me and has turned into a community of online anglers. Um, there are thousands of um, fly fishermen and women across the region and across the country that uh, join me there on that site where we have a forum, uh, where we have stream reports, uh, conversations about gear and a whole variety of other topics related to fly fishing in the Pennsylvania region. Uh, my background is I've been fly fishing for about 40 years now and uh, was very fortunate to have some good friends share with me the sport. And uh, as a result, uh, I felt that it was good for me to share back with others as well. And um, this is why I do these um, Zoom calls, as well as why I'm involved with the, uh, the website that I've been doing for 25 years now. So uh, I'll follow with some more information about the site if you're not familiar with it, but I'm sure many of you came across the program today, either on um, Twitter or Facebook or on my website. So um, as we get started, just a few items for you. Um, there's a chat area that uh, we should be able to communicate with as we're going forward. Looking to make this about a half hour, 45 minutes, certainly won't be an hour. And uh, being this is for beginners, I certainly encourage you to ask some questions. And if there's some things that are going on that are um, moving too fast for you, or if there's something that comes up that you know, you're trying to figure out, um, please, by all means, hit me up in the chat and I'll try to take a peek over there um, and try to answer your questions going forward. So again, this is meant to be a beginner's program uh, covering mostly mayflies. You know, as we look at all this, you're gonna see there's a lot in the mayfly species um, order that we're gonna cover. But for someone who's a new angler, who's been fly fishing for maybe one to five years, you're probably at a point where you're looking at all this stuff coming at you and realizing there's a whole lot more to it than you even thought. And the more you look at it, you're kind of going, wow, this mayfly thing, or even some of these aquatic insects are, pretty daunting sometimes, what does this all mean? So my intention of the program here in the next 45 minutes is to really kind of uncover the mayfly life cycle, help answer some questions for you and, and give you an idea of maybe some other resources, some ways to figure some things out for yourself about this. So let's uh, see about getting started. So one of the first things we're gonna cover in all this is there's a wide range of trout food out there. And this is really the, the big thing that everyone needs to understand is that trout are gonna go after fish and you're gonna have streamers that you'd use to imitate that. You have terrestrials, crustaceans, mammals even. If you've ever, um, if you ever have a chance, you can get on YouTube and Google um, uh, mouse and trout and you can see some pretty amazing um, uh, trout that will go after mouse imitations in certain areas. Most of you hear about them in Alaska or Labrador, but there are some people who will go mousing for trout in Pennsylvania as well. Fish eggs, and then of course, aquatic insects. All these are typically though found in different waters. They're, they're gonna be specific to certain types of times of year. Um, so of course, like a grasshopper is gonna be in the summertime. Uh, you're going to see, you know, egg, fish eggs, maybe either in the spring when there's a sucker spawn going on or when in the, in the uh, fall when there's other types of trout that are spawning at that point too. But we're going to take the time to look at specifically mayflies and even just talking a little bit about other aquatic insects, which is really what a lot of what we're doing here. We're putting on imitations that's going to attract a trout to catch a fish. So I'm going to throw a little bit of Latin at you. I know my, everyone's going, well, I don't know Latin. I don't know Latin either. I know that I took, I was a geography major in college. So um, my biology has been through learning, reading, and experiencing over the last 40 years fly fishing. Uh, I put the Latin names up here so we can be specific and differentiate some of that. Uh, the more you are becoming aware of fly fishing and angling, the more you're going to be aware of some of these Latin names is what it comes down to. And some of you may already have gotten some of this. And they said, wow, I didn't, I don't even know what they're talking about. What is this Latin part of this? What does this mean? And where do the Latin fits into what's going on? It's actually a way to specifically identify from a, from a biology standpoint, what flies we're talking about or what insects we're talking about. And most of the time we're talking about common names. So you may hear things like the March Brown or a green drake or a sulfur. And those are our common names. 
Uh, I'm not going to try to pretend to pronounce these Latin terms for us, but I'm going to use those as part of what we'll be representing a part of the screen. So when you look at a common name, um, like a March Brown, you'll also, also reference the Latin name as well. So you have something to kind of refer it to. But there's a whole deep science to all this. And you can imagine if you're familiar with other anglers that you've been hanging out with, um, they can get kind of detailed. And uh, the more you get into the sport, the more nuance to it all. And sometimes the Latin terms will come up once in a while. So I just make you aware that the biology is, is spe specifically used with the Latin terms most anglers are already to use the common names. And our most common names are stoneflies, caddisflies, and mayflies. And we'll be talking mostly about mayflies. How you differentiate between these three is really kind of easy. Um, they're all very similar sizes, okay? But the first one on the top there, our stonefly, the black little, little black stonefly, has its wings folded over. So you'll see those flying around right about now. I saw some today when I was out in the stream. And uh, they're typically pretty small out in the East Coast. They could get rather big on the West Coast and have a whole hatch going on with them there. And some anglers have a lot of success here in the East Coast with them or in Pennsylvania. They're, I'd say they're a minor aquatic insect though. Uh, and they have their wings folded over the back. The next one to the right is the caddisfly. Caddisflies are very popular and they can be found pretty much in most streams across all of Pennsylvania for a good period of time. Uh, long periods of time and many different species of them. And they're a little different in their wings. You'll recognize their wings as having sort of a tent. So you'll see their, so the stoneflies are like this, caddisflies are, have a tent wing shape to them. And then our last one is our mayflies. And you can see they have a folded out wing. And um, there's, we'll cover some more specifics on those because that's our main topic here tonight. So mayflies, again, is, one of the orders of insects, um, specifically, um, their, their name actually refers to short-lived and, sh and winged. And uh, again, we talk about entomology, which is a study of insects. And that's kind of what we're doing a little bit tonight, but we're gonna keep it into a fly fishing need and spectrum. They've been around for about 100, 125 million years. Largest one was ever found in, I think it was uh, in Europe, had an 18 inch wingspan. And, and today there's about 3000 species worldwide, 663 species in North America. And sometimes you'll hear them referred to as shad flies. Mostly that's a, a, a term referred to either out West or in Great Britain, I believe, but typically out East, you're never gonna hear, hear them referred to as shad flies. All right, so the life cycle. This is probably our most important part. So if you get anything that I'll be talking about tonight, this is the one thing you want to be walking away with. So the mayfly life cycle has four key components that we'll need to understand as anglers, okay? Our first one <clears throat> is the nymph stage, okay? And the nymphs are found on the bottom of the water. We'll cover a little more detail here. But for uh, the mayflies, 98% of the, their lives, 99% of their lives are lived underwater in this stage. Prior to this, they are eggs and larvae, and they molt and grow into this nymph stage. So nymphs live across the bottom of the water, either swimming or burrowing around or clinging onto rocks. <clears throat> and it's the most important part of, in the most longest period of time, when, you're, when the mayflies are in the water. And this, you need to understand this, because when you're out fishing, you're gonna have the best opportunity is nymph fishing, okay? The fun is certainly dry fly fishing. My, my favorite time I was out fishing a day and threw something on the, underneath right away. I saw some fish coming up to the surface, immediately put on a dry fly and tried to dry fly fishing because this is a lot more fun for me. But do understand, you know, 360 days out of the year, um, nymphs and mayflies living underneath the water for about one year. Uh, for a very brief moment, they're gonna emerge out. Okay, and this, this can last minutes or seconds. They're gonna leave that nymph stage, they're gonna molt, they're, they're gonna break out of that stage they're in and go to the surface. Um, how this happens for them, oftentimes there's a little bit of gas that develops inside their uh, casing. And so you'd see them fight to get it down or they'll be popped back up because of this gas. And it's at a very vulnerable period of time for them, but only lasts literally minutes uh, from the time they leave the bottom of, of the water uh, the rocks to the surface. 
So that's our second most important area. A third one is when they arrive and emerge out of the water and they are called duns. Okay. And this is the time most of us all recognize. You know, we're going to see mayflies on the surface. We're going to cast out to them. Our trout are going after them and they're just easy. We just catch them at that point. So we think about duns. All right. Our next phase that happens, which really isn't too important to the um, trout, but it's important for us to understand, is they're going to molt some more times. So when they, they get out of the water and they get to the air, they dry their wings and they molt a few more times. And they may only live about, hmm, about three to five more days, depending on what's going on. And during this molting process, they're really just there to mate and have sex and drop more eggs. Um, so during this period of time, they may actually change colors. So, you know, I, I kind of represented here that they were, oh, sorry, jumping the wrong way here. My uh, arrows won't go right for me. <clears throat> get back to our, so in this picture here, I, I represented a kind of a green drake looking green mayfly, um, or even another type of mayfly, which is called a blue winged olive by its common name. By the time it comes back out and molts a few more times during that week, um, it can actually change color and shape again, and may not even look what it looked like when it first came out of the water. At this point in time, it loses its mouth and only develops sex organs. And at that point in time, it's going to mate. And then finally, what it's going to be is the last and fourth and final stage that we'll talk about is called the spinner. And that's when the um, mayflies mate, come back in the water, deposit their eggs, and then die. So four main parts we need to think about, nymphs, mergers, duns, and spinners. Doing all right? All right, so our nymphs moving into these four categories, there's actually four types of nymphs then too. And again, I'm not gonna get too detailed on this because you can really get kind of get lost in the, the entomology and the weeds and the details, but there's just for reference point for, for many of you, there's four types of nymphs. <clears throat> there's clingers, which typically are found in fast ripples. And the more you do some research on some of this, you'll things like, find out things like a common name called Hendrickson's are clingers and you'll find them in the ripples. You have things like crawlers, which are on the bottom on the crawl on the rocks. You have other types of nymphs that are swimmers. And all of them look a little different depending on their, their need, their requirement to swim around. So the clingers are gonna be very wide, fat heads. And when you get to the bottom one, which is burrows, they're much bigger and actually green drakes are burrows, for example. Um, and we're, we're going to try to cover some more specifically. So if I'm throwing out common names to you that you don't recognize, I'm going to try to give you some examples of some of them. Certainly not going to be able to cover everything. There's just too many, uh, too many species as described there for us to cover all, but we're going to cover some of them in a little more detail along the way here. And again, if I'm going too fast, you have a question, something doesn't make sense, hit me up. So when nymphing, this is a, a picture of a... Um, green drake nymph. This is a pretty large nymph. For those of you who are familiar with green drakes, it's probably the largest mayflies in Pennsylvania. And their size is, you know, pretty recognizable and their mayflies, uh, the nymphs are pretty recognizable too, how big and large they are. And uh, again, as I mentioned, you're going to find those in the slow, muddier water kind of scenario. Let's talk about mergers. And again, it's a very brief period of time. And again, it's a major transition but they're very, very vulnerable at this point. I mentioned before, as they leave the bottom of the stream, they often develop this gas bubble inside their casing, come to the surface and then split out and they emerge as a dun. Uh, so it's a very short duration. So I'm gonna share with you some suggestions of what you can use during this period of time. Because you need to understand that when you're fly fishing, not all the time you're gonna see um, fish actively feeding on duns on the surface. It's one of the more frustrating periods of time when you're fly fishing is to find that you're in a hatch, mayflies are coming off, and there's no fish surfacing or taking those mayflies. And it's, it happens to all of us. It's one of the more countless and most frustrating situations and you're looking at the water going, why aren't these trout rising? Well, they may very well may just be taking the emergence underneath the water at that point in time. So you need to recognize what is it that they may be more interested in. 
it may be an easier opportunity for them to bypass the, the surface mayflies and actually just take the emergers underneath. So there's a lot of different patterns out there um, for anglers to use to imitate that emerger as it's coming off the bottom to the surface. And sometimes it's even just the, the fish or you can even see them doing this. You'll see them darting around. Or in some cases, you'll even see them what we're called porpoising, where you just see their back fin come up. But really what you're seeing happen is them going after the emergers just before they come to the surface. So it's just, just a matter of um, being familiar, watching the activity of the fish, watching the activity of the surface, and, and trying to uh, assess what your best options are going to be. So here's a few options. One is just going with a straight classic nymph imitation. Um, and this is a, a gold ribbed hair's ear nymph with a bead head on top. Um, the back casing can also be used with what's called a flashback, would have a little bit of like a plastically looking back, which would in a, kind of represent that um, plastic air bubble, that air bubble, I'm sorry, the plastic would, would look like the air bubble coming off there. The bead head could maybe look like the bu air bubble as well. <clears throat> but the bead head in this case helps weight the fly down. Another imitation in the emerger is a wet fly imitation. And these are really fantastic. Um, had a similar situation just a few weeks ago. I was out fly fishing out in Western Maryland, had a stonefly hatch. I mean, it was just horrific. Just lots of stoneflies, nothing coming up. Moved to a new spot, still had stoneflies. We switched over to an emerger pattern and started catching fish right away. So it was one of those examples I described to you earlier where there's insects coming off but you don't really know the trout aren't reacting to that surface activity. So you need to keep them underneath and try to find some way of attracting them that way. In this case, we used a, a wet fly imitation that worked best for us. There are some specific imitations by the patterns. So this is a sulfur imitation. Um, I think it's often used, I would, I would look at this one and say, I'd wanna use this over at Little Juni, on a Little Juniata, for example. I think maybe this may even be Bill Anderson's tie uh, type. And what this is, it's a merger you can see these wings, there's a little bit of poly on top here. And this fly is gonna sit just below the surface with the wings up on top. So again, imitating that fly emerging out of the water. And the last one I'm gonna talk about here is a cripple pattern. And this is actually not only a cripple pattern, but it's a spinner pattern. So we have multiple patterns being used for the same cycle, or same pattern used for different cycles of where the mayfly may be. In this case, what I mean by a cripple, is when a, a mayfly comes to the surface and is unable to expand its wings and fly away. So it sort of just dies or is stuck on the surface. So it's a, a merger that's failed to launch basically. And what you're looking for is using a pattern that's gonna imitate that failed emerger. Mm -hmm. And actually that, that emerge, I'll cut back to that with the spinner again, but that's a really important one. So our mayfly done, okay, is that phase that we most often are, are familiar with. That's when a mayfly makes it to the surface, gets its wings out, and it starts flying out from there. It takes, it can take literally seconds or minutes for a mayfly to flow down the stream and uh, get flight. It's got to get its wings unfolded, get some blood going to them, dry them out a little bit, and then take flight. So there's a little bit of a way to sort of help you understand which one you're looking at, though, because there's a lot of things happening in the water. And those of you who are not familiar with um, the mayflies, you can um, get yourself in a mindset to understand to learn which mayflies are there for yourself. And there's a couple ways to do that. <clears throat> so the first one to look at is the number of tails. That's probably one of the easy one. If you can see when they're that small, in this case, we have two. All right. Um, Hind wing is another one, and that's a little harder to see. Let's see if I can, if you look where the arrow is right there, you can see my arrow pointing to a hind wing, and it's a little hard to see, and most of the fly, mayflies I, I have pictured for us do have hind wings. Some are not there, but in this case, there is one. Then another way to differentiate these flies is the plane, or in this case, a mottled wing. And a mottled wing is simply a wing that has <clears throat> all this black and white in it. A plain wing would be a solid color. Next, we kind of look at the size. Um, and we, you know, you're familiar with those sizes based on hook sizes. So you might think about a small 18 size sulfur 
well, that may be a certain type of sulfur for us, or maybe a larger sulfur, but it may be a different species altogether. So your size does matter what you're looking at. And of course, coloring. Um, I'll talk about sulfurs in a minute. And some of the sulfurs, and in this case, this is a K-hole, which is not a sulfur. It looks very similar. Um, but you know, if you're trying to get match the hatch, you need to kind of understand what some of the differences are. Another way to identify your duns or mayflies that are coming off is the timing. Um, some mayflies are going to hatch all day long. A, a March brown, for example, will, will, long, will hatch in the mornings and all in the afternoons. Certain types of sulfurs will only hatch at like 7.30, 8 o'clock at night. So again, as you learn more about flies, location, mayflies locations, you'll also learn about timing. I know, for example, I can go to the Little Juniata, middle of May, and at 7.30, 8 o'clock, I have about a 90% chance somewhere in that stream, there's going to be a sulfur hatch coming off. I just know from experience, and I know what kind of 18 number, 18 sulfurs to go with that. But I also know that I can get there at 2.30 in the afternoon, there's maybe a chance in that same week, I'll have a blue wing gallop coming off about a size 16. But these are things that you learn from experience, but if you don't know that just yet, you got to learn how to recognize these different flies as they happen for yourself. Some other things that differentiate some of these duns include things like uh, the, their head and shapes and things like that. As you're just getting started, you know, I wouldn't worry about it. You're looking at mostly size and coloring and time of day is really what it matters for you. So here's our spinner. This is the fourth and final phase. One of the big things that is different about a spinner is, again, it's, it's molted a few times along the way. And as a result, the wings and body take a different shape and coloring. So the typical scenario in the last number, number five on this list here is the translucent wings. So you're going to recognize a spinner by the, the wings not looking the same as um, a dun, where a dun may have some more solid coloring to it or not translucent at all. Again, this is our final phase. Typically, not always, I'm going to use a lot of what I'm saying here are broad generalizations. So I'm sure if anyone out there is a, uh, an expert, and I know there's a few people on here that are uh, well-versed and have fish, maybe in fish longer than I have, um, I'm making some broad generalizations about what I'm saying. So I'm just trying to help. And there's always going to be exceptions to what I'm saying as well, too. Um, but in general, most mayfly spinners uh, are going to happen in the evening. Sometimes it'll be in the day, but um, typically starting in May, when you start seeing these, what we call a spinner fall. And that spinner fall is the time of period when after they've molted, they've gone up in the sky, they're up in the trees, they'll come down in the evening and they'll come down in the water and then they'll deposit their eggs and then die. It's a pretty spectacular event. It's, it's equally as spectacular as the hatch coming off. I enjoy the spinner fall even more. There's how many nights you're out there and I'm, I'm waiting for the spinner fall to happen. And, you know, it's getting really dark at and I'm looking up in the sky and I'm standing up there just looking and waiting and looking for these little, these little bugs that come down in the water. And all of a sudden out of nowhere, they can just land and there'll be this, you know, thousands and tens of thousands coming across the water. It's one of my favorite times to fish. Uh, and it's very consistent and very lucky to be able to fish those because if you if you wait around long enough, you can really have some great fishing opportunities uh, in when the spinner fall hits. Uh, one of my personal ways of fishing a spinner fall, and you can use different coloring on the bodies. My favorite one is just what we've seen already. This is a rusty spinner, and this rusty spinner is said to be rusty because the body colors are rusty. This is a latex wrap on the back. Um, I don't tie flies, I do computer stuff. So all these, all these flies I've taken pictures of are, are typically done by friends who've shared their flies with me, which I'm, I feel very fortunate to have some great friends who can tie so well. But these wings, you'll notice these wings are flat and uh, they're spread out with poly and it's meant to represent when they fall in the water, they're dead and not really gonna be making much action. Sometimes you can, when you're trying to use them and you need to, attract the fish the trout to your fly you can skate them sometimes so what i mean by that is you drop them in and you try to skitter them across a little bit um but this is my favorite one of my favorite flies by all means you know you can have all kinds of hatches that are happening but typically what you'll find yourself in a scenario is you may have a, a 
a mayfly hatch happening that may last days. So sulfurs may last for two or three, four weeks. But somewhere following those first hatches, the spinners will start coming back in the water, depositing their eggs and dying. So right after the mayfly hatch from a rusty from a sulfur at eight o'clock, you may find the spinner fall happening at nine. So it's a pretty exciting time in the evening to have both a hatch come off and then a spinner fall right after that. And you're of course switching flies, um, but um, it's a pretty exciting time. It's one of my favorite times to go fishing with, with the rusty spinners. Um, I don't think I was going to add to spinners. It's, it's, a, it's a good one to learn, I would suggest. I've actually had one experience where <clears throat> uh, I was on Penn's Creek, and I find Penn's Creek, if you've ever fished there, a very difficult stream to fly fish. I mean, I've been there. If I'm happy if I can get three or four trout in a day. So one April, I was on there, and there was a lot of um, blueing olives coming off in the middle of the day, and they weren't taking my fly at all. So sort of Felt like let me just go to a go-to fly that I feel very comfortable with. And I tied on a small rusty spinner, thinking that maybe that there may have been some uh, cripples that came out of the hatch that just didn't make it. And sure enough, I ended up catching three days in a row, 12, about 12 trout a day on simply just a rusty spinner, nothing else, just because those mayflies were coming off and the trout were keying in on the dead um, mayflies that were coming off and I, my rusty spinner imitation worked. All right. So another, another part to all this too is um, sex identification. It's not really too important for an angler. It's just something interesting to know. So these flies right here are again, are green drakes. They are magnificent flies, the beautiful but um, I'm not sure if you can see this all right or not, but on the left side is our female and our right is our male. And the, the, major, di the major differentiators between the two are gonna be on the male, there's gonna be a front forcep that's gonna stick out, if you can see that in the picture. And in the rear behind its um, hindquarters, uh, it has little graspers as well. So um, the really, they have no mouths, just sex organs. And um, they're really just built to mate and then lay their eggs at this point. And this is actually a picture of a um, rusty spinner. They're often called, uh, green drake spinners are called coffin flies, just because of that white body that you saw. So when you see a, a big white spinner in this case, uh, it's a coffin fly for specifically just the green drakes. So I'm sharing with you here is what's called a hatch chart. And I'm not sure if any of you have seen this before. A lot to take in, not gonna to try to cover it all. And you can go to my website and you can see that on here. And other, lots of other sites have them. Most of the fly shops have hatch charts, things like that. And they're gonna vary a little bit from location and even specific areas. So some streams, you know, I'm, I'm, doing a, I'm doing a Pennsylvania broad kind of, you know, what, what's happening across the state. Um, some areas and regions are going to differ week by week, quite frankly. But I have a common name here, little blue winged olive, hook sizes, start dates. So I was seeing blue winged olives in the middle of March. Typically, it's a size even smaller than the 16 to 20s, quite frankly. I'd say it's more like a 24. And sometimes you'll see a, a 16 or an 18 show up, but also the time of day. Uh, blue quills and quill gordons uh, should be starting real soon, depending where you're at. This night, wet, nice weather, maybe some kicking off already right now. Uh, I'm going up to Fishing Creek uh, tomorrow, and I would wouldn't be surprised if I started seeing blue quills, quill gordons, and um, Hendrickson's and uh, red quills up there already. Um, the next big hatch that happens is the sulfurs, which I've mentioned uh, their name quite a bit. And uh, there's multiple species of sulfurs in different sizes. And uh, they're pretty prolific across the whole state starting in early May through early June. And it's probably one of the more dependable and more exciting hatches to kind of take advantage of through uh, a month or more. One of the bigger hatches is the March Brown. And uh, it's, that can start as early as, I'll have a picture and we'll cover those in detail here, but um, they're pretty big and they can start as early as end of April depending where you're at. 
gray foxes, and there's a few others here. And then when you get start getting into later seasons, um, things like blue ingalos, slate drakes also come back again, in, even in the fall. So it's not just April, May, and June, which is typically what it is, but there's also hatches that occur uh, in the fall again as well. And there's a different species typically what's going on. I mean, I actually even had one time I was on La Tort, which is a um, stream that is uh, in this limestone stream in south central Pennsylvania. And on that stream in December, there was a hatch of sulfurs that came off. Now it wasn't the same sulfur species that we saw in May, but there was some, you know, it was almost snowing outside. We've had a hatch of, of sporadic hatch of sulfurs coming off, which was really kind of unique for that location. So I encourage you to, if you really want to get in detail, kind of take a look at some of these hatch charts that you can find either on my site or plenty of other locations to look up. You can just Google Pennsylvania hatch chart and you'll find uh, what you're looking for either by a fly shop or any number of other uh, people who are offering some details about them. Let's take a look at some specific uh, mayflies. And uh, I covered some of the differences between each of these species. Um, but one of them I like a lot here is the March Brown. I like this a lot because you're gonna find it. <clears throat> it's a big fly and it's uh, pretty noticeable when you see it in the water. It doesn't have a really prolific hatch. You're not gonna see thousands coming off the stream at one time, but you're typically gonna find them in freestone streams in um, central and north Pennsylvania. Um, but the, the thing I like about them the most is that you can catch them um, coming off the water in um, late April, but more likely early May, and uh, the pretty good size fly. And this is the uh, imitation that the tie for it. You can notice that the uh, the body in the back there, person that tied this, kind of tried to imitate that um, body segment by doing a wrap across the back there. So sulfurs, I've been talking to them a lot. Um, there are many different types of sulfurs out there. Um, so Latin names, I will start to say Latin here because I can say these Rotunda, Inveria, and Dorothea are three common names, common Latin names for different sulfurs. And each one of these is different. This is where it gets a little bit, um, people start getting a little bit detailed about, okay, there, there are differences and sometimes there's actually the same. So recently it's been, commonly agree that rotunda and invarias are actually the same. Um, so a little bit of arguing between people about, you know, whether or not they're different. Typically though, it's a timing, it's a size thing. Um, and you can find even some species that may look a little different from stream to stream, uh, the same species, just because of some characteristics of the water or just some different breeding that's been going on in a certain body of water for a while. Sulfurs are typically kind of smaller. Um, there are some larger ones, size 12, but they're gonna have a plain whitish wing and a yellow body. There's some other Cahills, which I showed you earlier, and pale morning doves that are often, can, that look like them. And you could probably use the same fly in some cases and do just fine. Um, that's the overlap with some other species, but they're pretty prolific, a lot of places, and you should always be carrying blueing, um, sulfurs with you at all times. And took a picture of this the other day, kind of ugly looking fly there, but it works. Um, the idea is again, yellow body, whitish wings, and a lot of different ways to make these two. All right, blueing olives, another really important species. Um, a lot of different species as well. This is a specifically one that um, hatches in June up in Northern Pennsylvania. It's a little bit larger, size 14. You can see the plain wing as opposed to the mottled wing. Uh, there's a hind wing on this and has three tails. So it's the Dronella alata. Uh, but there's a lot of other blueing olives. I mean, blueing olives are typically just that blue wing, olive, blue wings, olive body. And again, you can carry uh, any number of sizes from 
22s, which are very, very small to size 12 and 14s. And if you keep plenty of them with you, they're gonna serve you well. And here's an example of a pretty good looking tie um, of a blue wing olive. No questions, quiet crowd tonight. All right, so just kind of covering about a hatch, how to match the hatch. We've covered a lot of different things. The way I do it, and I'm not saying the right way, you could talk to anybody, you're going to find it a million different ways to approach this. I always like to look at, you know, what time of day is it? You know, if it's morning, 11 o'clock, I can, in my mind, know that certain flies are going to come off, mayflies are going to come off in the morning. There are afternoon flies. Um, I'm then thinking about, I'm seeing this surface, these mayflies come off, are the trout feeding on them? Uh, and if they are, where are they feeding? What size are the mayflies and what are the coloring? And are these duns or spinners I'm thinking about as well. So then there's a lot of other factors too, like what stream am I on? What's my geography? Um, but, you know, when you start getting into it, you can start realizing with some of those hatch charts that, you know, if it's seven o'clock at night and I'm on the Little Juliana and it's May 15th, it's probably a sulfur, you know, by all the things I'm seeing there. I wouldn't get too hung up on the number of tails. <laughs> I mean, that's not going to concern you too much if you're trying to match whether it's a, a yellow body, white winged mayfly, but this is for conversation and interest later on if you're looking for. Um, Again, the bigger challenge often is going to be, as I said today, I was, I was out fly fishing and there I, could, I couldn't see any flies coming off yet the trout were surfacing. So at that point in time, you're just sort of winging it as to what's going to work for you. I have trout coming to the surface. First thing I went for is I went for a mayfly. The reason I did that was because it was pretty small. So I tied on a 22 may, uh, blue wing olive and they didn't take them. They came up and looked at it, but wouldn't take it. I switched over to a Griffiths gnat, which is another type of tie uh, pattern, very buggy looking on the surface, very small as well. And they went for that. Why? I don't know. I couldn't see anything on the surface at all, but they were surfacing for something really small. So sometimes that's why you're going to, you know, you have to experiment it for the day. The same thing happens the other way, which is even more frustrating, which is, I said earlier, you have mayflies coming off the surface and they're not coming up. So you have to really improvise at that point as to, you know, what, what is it if they are at all taking anything? And that's trying different types of emerger patterns or nymphs to attract them to that subsurface, act, subsurface activity for yourself. All right, this is where I get to talk about things I like. The other stuff is pretty factual. This is just my personal preference. So you can talk to a thousand anglers, you can get a thousand different answers on this. <clears throat> um, so my five best dry fly patterns that I like, um, first one is the atoms. And that's what we see right here. And this is actually called a pattern, it's called a parachute atoms. The reason it's called a parachute is because the wings, as opposed to having that wrap around it going vertically, this is horizontal. And we have a little bit of a white puff across the top great indicator pattern and it's not specific to an atoms it just happens to be this tie as a parachute atoms <clears throat> and the reason i like atoms so much it's just a generic there is no such thing as an atoms hatch of course but it's a great uh pattern that can imitate and mock so many different things i've used them on any number of situations where i'm not sure what's going on i'll tie a little atoms on and you know get some luck on it because it's a, a, truly a generic pattern Next one, I always make sure I'm carrying around with the blue wing olives because they're blue wing olives are pretty much going to occur for many, many months. So having a good supply and size range of blue wing olives is important. Talked already about, about sulfurs, how much I like those. Having a good supply and good range of sulfurs is really important, especially in the May time period. Um, my rusty spinner. I, wouldn't go home without one you know i just got to have those with me at all times um and, and again, again good range of size i actually quite frankly the bigger the rusty spinner the happier i am the the darker it gets the bigger the rusty spinner i put on the more my chances are i think are going to increase with me catching a fish at that point in time i've gone so far as to fish in the dark with the biggest rusty spinner i can with a headlamp on and just tossing them out there and dragging them across the surface and waiting to get that 
tug and setting the hook that way. And uh, I don't do as much as I used to, I'm not as young, um, not as bound to stand in a, in a dark stream by myself. Uh, it's not, I don't like the risk on that, but I can tell you that I've had a lot of success doing that with rusted spinners. Haven't talked about caddis too much, but I'd say the other uh, dry fly pattern you always want to have for yourself is elk hair caddis. Again, we haven't spent any time on that specific aquatic insect, but um, this particular pattern kind of tries to represent those tent wings I talked about earlier. And uh, caddis are another species, like almost like blue winged olives. They're not the same species, of course, but they're going to be around seasonally for quite a long periods of time and many, many months and having a good supply of caddis with you is really, really important. So nymph patterns and nymph patterns get to be a little bit more generic. Uh, and I say that because, you know, I'm not talking about specifically having with me a blue winged olive nymph or a sulfur nymph. Um, nymph patterns end up being a lot more generic. So uh, a bead head is always really good to have with you, as I've shown you here. A pheasant tail in this pattern is nice. And again, some different sizes for yourself. <clears throat> uh, this one, I'm a little sorry. You can't see the, the gold ribbed on the back body of this, but it's in there that the, the, the body has some gold ribbing wrapped around there. Again, most of these things are just looking really buggy. I mean, we say that, I mean, it is just a lot of, um, they don't look really pretty by any means, but the trout do uh, find them pretty attractive. I mentioned earlier about a, a soft wet hackle, wet fly, soft hackle wet fly. Um, there's some real techniques about wet fly fishing that if you get a chance to read up on it, I highly encourage it. It's a highly effective way to go after trout uh, and it's its own technique as well. And finally, to complement the caddis is a caddis emerger. And again, another thinner body, uh, but a dark head uh, towards the top there as well. Uh, so I have a couple questions. How long do you fish a fly before you change to something different? Uh, that's a really good question. So I'll just say like today, I was out on the stream for only an hour and a half. And I had a pool in front of me and I saw probably 30 or 40 trout and I switched out probably after 10 minutes on the ones that I, I wasn't catching anything so I was like okay I'm done 10 minutes I'm finished I'm, I'm not I can't I know the fish are feeding I can see them surfacing they're not taking what I'm, I'm taking I what I have so I'm not going to waste my time for a half hour fishing over these these fish if they're not going to take what I have I got to switch it out and after 10 minutes it worked for me um, the other thing is you, you can be in a situation where you do see a hatch and you know, what's coming off. Let's say it is bluing dollars or sulfurs, you know, giving yourself that 10, 15 minutes, you may switch size. Okay. You may keep, keep this, you know, you know, it's a bluing olive hatch, but you want to switch up or switch down in size because the size is going to be really pretty important for it for them to key in on. So, um, timing wise, I can be impatient though, too. Sometimes I only go for five minutes and second guess myself pretty quickly as to that was a pretty stupid move Dave let me change that out <clears throat> um, another question uh, what do you like as a searching pattern when no flies are in the air uh, okay so what, what do I think about when no flies are in the air would it be when there's there no flies are in the air so just jumping in the water no flies in the air looking at a stream um, I'm going to probably start off with some of those nymphs that I showed you earlier that I, my favorite patterns, um, something with a little bit more of an attractor to it. If I think that uh, they're gonna be emerging later, I might go with the bead head, um, but the gold rib hairs air is just always a great way to go or a wet fly is a great way to go too. So I'm gonna start with some of those, but those, are, those nymphs are generally pretty generic looking and can apply to any number of fish out there. Um, there's a whole range of other nymphs you can you can fish with of course but you know if i'm going to start with something it would be one of those five in that category um, also if i know that there's going to be some um caddis coming off that day i would go with a caddis nymph in it within a heartbeat just because i know they have a good chance of pulling something off that way so
What's your process when you show up to a stream or a section you haven't fished before? Another good question. Um, I don't fish in one spot regularly. So most of my streams I'm going to are always going to be brand new to me. So um, what I end up doing is my process is going to be just taking a little bit of time before I get to that stream and knowing, is it a freestone? Is it a limestone stream? What's the geography up there? Is it around farmland? Is it up in the mountains? How big is it? Um, you know, I, I started fly fishing and I relied completely on books. Um, there was some, and I still have them all. There's fantastic books that I used to read that gave me the insight I needed to get started with fly fishing. So I might read up a little bit on that to kind of know what's going to happen in some of those areas. And I'm going to get into some of those um, um, geographies to know that what am I going to run to? Some streams you're going to be very specific and only maybe only have one hatch on a day and you're going to try to understand that. Some streams like Penn's Creek, if you're there in the middle of May and it's seven o'clock at night, you could have five or six different hatches going off at one time. And it's going to be, you know, it's an exciting place to be, but also frustrating to all get out. And once I get to the stream, I'm always going to stand by the stream for five minutes and just take a look and assess what's going on. You know, there's no sense for me to just tie up and jump in the water. I'm always going to want to see if are the fish surfacing in some areas? Where are they surfacing? Are there any mayflies coming off? And just sort of get a lay of the land. Are there birds? I'm always looking for birds too. You know, where are the birds at? Are they close to the surface? Or are they high up in the air? And that tells you a little bit about what's going on too. If the birds are high up in the air, that kind of tells me there's probably spinners waiting to come down that night. If the birds are coming across low across the water, that means there's maybe some sort of small or, or hatches that are happening at that point too. Not a guarantee, but just gives me some indication of what's going on. Uh, so do you find hatches to be different based on sunny days, cloudy, party cloudy? Absolutely. Um, yeah, the bright blue sky, sunny days are probably the worst day to go fly fishing. <laughs> um you know sometimes they can be good so a couple weeks ago we were out fishing stone flies coming off bright sunny day couldn't catch a thing moved to some cover where we had some trees that were casting some shadows into some areas switched over to those wet flies and we caught some fish so you know the trout aren't going to be aren't typically big fans of of bright you know sunny days i have been on streams though that they're stock trout and um Bright sunny day, I'm out there catching fish, nymph and below. It just happens sometimes. Uh, I think that a cloudy day, even a rainy day, one of the best days I ever had in Spring Creek was there was a uh, sulfur hatch that started at about two o'clock in the afternoon. I caught more fish on, sul on sulfurs that afternoon in a rainstorm than I had any other time fishing on Spring Creek. Fantastic day. I had good raincoat on, so I wasn't getting particularly wet. So I just stayed out there all day and just caught dozens of fish. Um, so definitely cloudy days are your better day to be out there. And rainy days can work too if you want to tolerate the rain, but no guarantee. And don't, don't curse me when you're out there in the rain, you're not catching any fish. Uh, have you ever tried a matty wet fly? No, I haven't. Uh, do we have, I haven't done that. I actually haven't done a lot of wet fly fishing. That's one on my list to do more of. Um, um, I, I end, up, end up doing more specifically nymph fishing and just dry fly fishing, but wet fly fishing is um, something I've done, but not to the extent that I, I could call myself an expert by any means. Um, cool. Have any more questions? Great. Well, um, as I mentioned, my name is Dave Kyle. For those of you not familiar with my website, PA Fly Fish. It's a community of online anglers which can be found pretty easily at paflyfish.com. If you have any questions for me, I'm pretty easy to find as well. I can be found there at the website. Um, you can type in Dave Kyle at PA Fly Fish and you can find my Twitter handle if you want to follow me there. And uh, then my email there is dkyle at PA Fly Fish, which is probably part of your registration process and more than glad to help answer any questions for you. I encourage you to get to the website. Like as I mentioned, there are hundreds if not thousands of anglers there as part of a community sharing what they know and we have a section just specifically designed for beginners to help you if you're having a question you don't feel as a the audience for 
everyone, but want to just uh, ask something you feel maybe you're just not familiar with yet. So we have a whole section set aside for beginners specifically. So I um, hope this was something helpful for everyone. And uh, it was a pleasure to see everybody out tonight. And uh, as you may realize that with April here, and as I've described to you, it's, it's going to start getting pretty pretty good here with the mayflies and other activity on the surface. So uh, enjoy yourselves this spring, uh, stay safe and, and have fun. Thank you very much.